Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today, I'm speaking with a data scientist at UC Berkeley's Center for Effective Global Action. If you're interested in maths, social science, academia, or really any work focused on helping developing countries, this is one you shouldn't miss. If you're somehow listening to this, but not yet subscribed on your phone, get a podcast app right now and throw us on there. That way, you can speed up the conversation to the ideal level, listen whenever your brain would otherwise be going to waste, and never miss an episode. If you've got room for other podcasts to listen to besides this one, can I suggest trying BBC4's More or Less? It's a guide to numbers in the news hosted by economist Tim Harford. If you enjoy chasing down statistics that are being cited all over the place to check whether they're bullshit or not, it will be your kind of show. I listen in every week. And now I bring you Ophia Reich. Today, I'm at Ear Global uh, San Francisco, speaking with Ophir Reich. That, that's correct, right? That's pretty good. Ophir Reich <laughs> is the full, uh, full on for advanced version, but that's good. <laughs> uh, I'll practice later. Ophir uh, joined the Center for Effective Global Action in 2015 as a data scientist, where he works on several data intensive research projects uh, around global poverty. He was previously a mathematical research team leader in a technology unit of the Israeli army, and then chief data scientist and machine learning expert for a Tel Aviv-based startup. He holds a mathematics and physics Bachelor of Science from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and now has eight years of experience in groundbreaking applied mathematical research. Thanks for coming on the show, (laughs) Ophir. Thanks, Rob. It's uh, it's great to be here. I'm happy to, to take part. Uh, So in the second half of the interview, uh, I hope we'll get to talking about how people can actually uh, solve global poverty using their quantitative skills. But first, uh, tell us a bit about the Center for Global Action at Berkeley and what you do there. Sure. So the Center for Effective Global Action, or CEGA, C-E-G-A is the acronym, uh, is based in UC Berkeley. Uh, It has three main activities. So I'm going to separate those out, even though they're all sort of under the umbrella uh, organization. It was uh, founded, I think, seven or eight years ago by uh, Professor Ted Miguel, who's a very renowned development economist. And so these three separate parts are, uh, one, the global networks, where CEGA brings in uh, scholars from developing countries to spend a semester at UC Berkeley, uh, forming ties with other academics, learning, being exposed to more impact evaluation work, uh, and then going back to their countries and hopefully leading you know, a prosperous academic career and also having these partnerships, uh, hopefully creating impact through both research and through um, you know, relationships with governments in their, in their countries of origin. So that's one that's Global Networks. Then the second activity is called the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences, or BITS with two S's. And that's basically trying to address problems in the social sciences known as the reproducibility crisis. Uh, So many of the results reported in science journals are either false or problematic or don't reproduce, meaning somebody tries to recreate the same research and then they get different results. And so that's a big problem for science. And so the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences, along with some other actors in this field, tries to promote better science practices, such as open data, where you have your data, if you do research, your data should be available to other people to try and, you know, see if you maybe analyze it wrong or if there's some other reason and find, you know, trying to build on your work. And you should also be uh, publishing your code so that your research is reproducible and people can see that you just don't simply have a bug, for example, or that they can see what you've done, exactly what observations you drop, and all these practices that then could be used even sometimes maliciously, but most of the times not maliciously, to generate results that that later turn out to be false. And then pre-registration, which is, you know, pre-committing to what analysis you're going to do to prevent what's called p-hacking, where you just try a bunch of different different tests until you get something that's significant and publishable, and then you publish that, obviously leading to, to problems later on. So that's trying to help uh, social science uh, be better and more reproducible uh, and more open. So that's the Berkeley Initiative for, for Transparency in the Social Sciences, or BITS. And then there's the third branch yeah. of, uh, of SIGA, which is about global poverty uh, specifically and about Uh, academic research about global poverty. So this is a network of academics, over 70 academics that are affiliated with SIGA and also are at uh, various universities on the West Coast of the United States and Canada. They all do research in development economics or related field, but all related to global poverty. So some engineers and some computer scientists uh, all trying to invent and then do research and test solutions to problems of of global poverty. And that's Um, the one that you're in. And that's the one that I'm in, yes. So, so SIGA, the staff, you know, directs these, these plus of funding and compete it out to 
to academics to produce top-notch academic research about the problems of poverty so that we understand it better, find better tactics for poverty alleviation, and so on. So what kind of specific data science research projects are you working on at the moment? So I'm currently working on three projects. One is a project about uh, value-added tax evasion in a state in India where we are trying to better target companies that are set up in order to evade taxes and thereby increase government revenues. Because if you can find these companies that are false companies just being set up in order to create this false paper trail that is then used to avoid paying taxes and basically defraud the, the state, then if you can target these better and find the ones that are, that are fraudulent, you can increase tax revenue, which is good because then it will be spent on, you know, on the poor in the state. Uh, and so we're trying to use we are using data of the past years of tax returns, uh, evaluated tax returns, in conjunction with companies that are known to have been found to be these, these false companies to, to create a targeting mechanism using machine learning, basically. So we're using these tax returns and the companies that we know to, be, to have been found in the past to be fraudulent and thereby automatically finding a way to target target companies that are more likely to be fraudulent and then target them for inspections. So it's a little bit what like the tax office might do here or you know what Visa and MasterCard would the kind of machine learning that they'll do to try to identify fraudulent transactions is it similar work? I think it's similar in some respects. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have different data than some of those some of those have and Everything is very different in the developing world. So a yeah. lot of things are like physical and a lot of the data integrity is an issue because we don't generate our own data. Mm. But, but yeah, there are similar, similar lines. And I actually worked in fraud detection before. That's my, mm. that's my background. In the private sector. In the private sector in a, for a startup mm. uh, back in Israel. Uh, what are some of the other projects? So a second project is working with uh, an organization called Precision Agriculture for Development. And this organization tries to improve agricultural extension using information communication technology or basically mobile phones in developing countries, yeah. right? So we know that often farmers don't adopt the best practices in developing countries through research. And we think some of this adoption can improve by having agricultural extension be more effective. So example, if you inform people about the benefits of fertilizer and advise them how to use it and how much they should use right before the time that they are about to buy fertilizer, they might buy the right amount of fertilizer and then use it on their field and then increase their, their yields and, the, and more importantly, their, their profits. And so the, the basic assumption is that even if the effects that you get are not enormous, uh, because not everybody's going to listen to you know, a message from on a mobile phone, still the cost is so little that in cost effectiveness terms, this can be very large. And so we also attempt to bring in other factors into this, such as, uh, you know, weather and prices and all these to create what we say, precision agriculture and soil tests, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. So the organization works on these kind of ICT projects. Uh, so I'm involved. There are a few of these around around the world. I'm current, I was involved in one in, uh, in India, in Gujarat, and then now starting to, to get involved in one in Ethiopia uh, with, the, with the government of Ethiopia. So the, the data science aspect there is that you're trying to figure out what actual advice you should offer the farmers given current weather conditions and soil conditions and so on? Not necessarily. So there's, there's a bunch of things. The first thing you could do is trying to, I mean, there are a lot of data problems that are related to this. So one of them could be, yes, we have all these data sources for weather and we want to know, you know, how reliable they are, how to use them and, you know, produce a recommendation. But also you want to know things about your users, right? Like what is, what works better for our users? Is, is it, does it work better if we divide the menus this way or that way? How to see if people, you know, are, are not interacting with your system in the way that you would want. So in a sense, this is more like standard research conducted in, in many companies that have like product users. engineering. Yeah, uh, but then you, you apply it in this in this way that's not necessarily standard. But then there are a lot. There's there are various other other data data work as well, the, working with soil tests and realizing how to you know interpolate them in the right way in order to give a recommendation on each location, not just where the soil tests were taken, how reliable those are, and, yeah. and many others. Do you ever worry that you might be sending out bad advice, or are you pretty confident that it's better than than what people are doing already? So we, we often rely on, uh, on other agencies to, to produce some of this advice. So, for example, you have like, you know, the agricultural authorities in, in several of these countries that do rigorous testing and have test plots and have a lot of research around this. And we also try to very rigorously test what we're doing. So we're hoping to constantly, constantly improve this and also, and also always know and always measure. How do you, how do you test it? 
Uh, so we often have either A-B testing for many things that you can find with your system. So if you're familiar with that term, it means basically you have you know, a group of users and then you know, for half of them, you randomly let them use the services that exist today. And for the other half, randomly, randomly selected half, you, uh, you let them use you know, the variation of your service. Uh, and then you compare the interaction of those two groups with your system and you see how it works. But we also uh, do many randomized control trials, or RCTs for short. And so these would be, you know, having some kind of change in the system and then measuring outcomes either in calling people and asking about their satisfaction, about their change of behavior and so on, or ideally really measuring yields. The problem with this in agriculture is that it takes a long time until you actually see the yields. And so you, you're searching for things that are a little more immediate. Yeah, I was thinking... You're going to send text to some people and not to others, and then you have to go out and measure the yields, or I guess ask them to say what yields they got. Is that is that how you how you test it? Or yeah. so that that would be testing the testing the yields in the yeah. end. But yeah, for example, there was there's a randomized control trial that sort of spawned uh, Precision Agriculture for Development, this organization, which is in in India by uh, Sean Cole, one of the co-founders of the organization, and Ilish Fernando, where they they did just that. They had a voice uh, service where they would call farmers once a week with an automated message about relevant practices for that week. And farmers could also call in and, and ask questions, and those would be answered by agricultural experts. And so they did a randomized controlled trial where some people were exposed to this service and some weren't, and they then asked them for, for their yields, and, and they found very good returns to, to the investment in the order of, of 10 times the, the money, the monetary investment. Is, is there a third project? Yes. So the third project is, I'm not going to go into all the details, but it's, about, it's around mobile salary payments for teachers in, uh, in Afghanistan. And so the point is that uh, the current payment system uh, may be not optimal. And so the, the Afghan government is thinking about shifting to paying teacher salaries through mobile money, like M-Pesa, if you're familiar with that, or it's like Venmo, but in developing countries, they've had it for many years now. Yeah. It's uh, probably, probably better than Venmo, right? <laughs> yeah, it works on a feature phone as well, which Venmo doesn't. So yeah. <laughs> added advantage. But so they want to pay teachers this way and see uh, the benefits of this, whether it works better and, you know, reducing these transaction costs and, and allow these things. And so the research team is, is evaluating that, uh, that effort. Skipping back to the, to the tax evasion uh, case, what kind of data do you have to work with there when you're trying to identify these fraudulent companies? Mm -hmm. So first of all, we're working very, very closely with, with the government on this. So this is very much a partnership, which is a, a good way of doing these things if you want something to actually happen in the world. And we have uh, the universe of, of value-added tax returns uh, from the state in India. And so we have every return that every company filed for the past few years. They file every quarter. And so we know who sold to whom for how much. So we have the full network of, of these different companies uh, and, and, you know, who interacted with whom at which time period mm -hmm. and so on. So that's one piece of it. But then in order to, if you're familiar with machine learning, in order to make a prediction, you need uh, what's called labels. You need some, we want to predict fraudulent firms. And so we need to identify the difference between fraudulent firms and firms that are not fraudulent. Uh, and so we have uh, a set of firms that the government has identified in the past as being fraudulent because they have their sort of current uh, manual review process where they, they inspect these companies and then they just they go to inspect the company and they find that there's nothing there. This company only exists on paper. Mm. Uh, and so we have those as our labeled set, and that's what we use for, for our predictions. Uh, hopefully we get we will continue to work with them to have them act on our future predictions so, you know, get the data and then produce further predictions to have them inspect these future companies and then have those feed back into our system to improve our system. How, how different is a complicated machine learning approach to just seeing what characteristics are correlated with a company being fraudulent in the, in the sample that you have? Is it, is it much more successful and, and is it like that much harder to, to grasp what's actually going on? So it's not always simple to know. And this data set, though it might seem very comprehensive, doesn't tell you very intimate things about this company, right? It's sort of very, it's Spouse. very kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's all anonymous, right? You know who sold to whom, but you don't know what these companies do or what their businesses. We don't, we don't even fully understand all the mechanisms by which uh, these fraudulent companies act and how exactly all of this works. Do they sell to each other? Do they have a complex that where you don't know all these things? So I definitely think domain expertise is crucial uh, in this. And I think we'll learn more as we go on. But I don't think it's as simple as saying like, oh, okay, there's this single indicator mm -hmm. and you just look at that and that's very correlated. Because we see, I mean, again, get a little technical, we can see that when, when we add these more complicated machine learning approaches and 
and added what's called more features, so more different features of our data and all the, the sort of uh, different characteristics of these of these firms and their behavior, we get much better much better results. So, is it already useful the algorithm that you have? So, I'd be I'm always kind of uh, skeptical and cautious. Mm -hmm. So, I think for you know for the standards of of many machine learning applications. It is useful in the sense that you know we can see that our predictions are good on our data, mm. but I want to be cautious about that and say that I'll only really believe it when uh, when we actually get data and then produce this list of recommendations of of companies to inspect and then we inspect them and see you know that they're that they're really a percentage of them are bogus. You know, it's like the trick of the magician giving you the envelope and then you open it and it's you know your dollar bill that you signed in there, right? So we have to give those and actually see that it actually holds true. What are some other interesting things that, that Seeger is doing? Are there any projects that stand out? So it's important to say that a lot of these projects are carried out by, by Seeger affiliates that are professors in various universities. And so we have, again, over 70, 70 affiliates, mm. uh, again, for this global poverty research. But most research of them thing. are in your office. So yeah, yeah. Way. They're on various, I mean, uh, almost none of them are in our office. They're on various universities, not even the same university. We're based at UC Berkeley, but they're along the West Coast. And they, they do a host of uh, interesting research projects uh, from better measurement of poverty from using remote sensing from outer space to a lot of, you know, huge, uh, large-scale RCTs, randomized control, tr control trials, such as, you know, evaluating the effect of, you know, voucher systems in India is a, is a project that a SIGA affiliate called Kartik Murali Dahan has performed, I think is, is excellent. And so there are a lot of these very exciting research projects by, by different people. How much impact has your work or SIGA's work as a, as a whole had? So that's a hard question. I could, I could answer more for... For my work, since I'm very closely monitoring it, of course, because I, I always want to sort of direct myself to the most impactful place. About about Sega, maybe I'll start with that. I think I think it, attribution is difficult, right? I mean, it's hard to know. They're very influential people. There are ideas that change, but it's very hard to know, did research change this specific policy, this specific idea? So it's very hard to know that we did. And, and you know, ironically, we are the people that do RCTs because we say that attribution is difficult, <laughs> right? But it's hard to do like an RCT of like, you know, half the people will produce academic research and half <laughs> won't, and then we'll see how that works out. So so I think we have, we, we're, we're first to use like some anecdotes. We have some, some anecdotes of impact, but attribution is very difficult. And in the end, it comes down to, some people thinking, yes, top academic research, advancing knowledge in these fields has given us has given us a lot of understanding and insight into what's going on, and some people being more skeptical. But I think there are a lot of uh, smart people on both sides. Can you think of any cases where it seemed like you know, funding was redirected based on on your insights, or uh, like policy was changed in some way? There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of examples from the the broader RCT movement. For example, from JPL, I can give exa an example from from India. There was research by, uh, again, the same affiliate that I'm, different research by the affiliate that I mentioned before, Kartik uh, Mohalal that he's at uh, UC San Diego. And he did research about a system that they had that uses uh, in Andhra Pradesh, in India, they use, um, they use biometric smart cards to ID people, to identify them, and also have them authenticate when they receive payments from the government. So there are two different uh, welfare payment programs, and people had to use these biometric smart cards so they didn't just produce you know, a, a paper ID or something. They had a smart card that contained their biometric information, so a fingerprint, and they had to put in the card and then put their finger on a scanner, and only if it was them, you know, the funding was... Dispensed. Uh, yeah, it was dispensed. And so... They did this reform, and this was evaluated in a, uh, in a huge RCT over several districts in this Indian state of, you know, uh, tens of millions of people. And, and they found that what's called leakage, which is a euphemism for, you know, corrupt officials stealing some of the money intended for beneficiaries, has been significantly reduced by millions of dollars, which is more than the, much more than the, the program cost. And so Karthik tells the story that uh, they were in a, a government meeting with very senior officials, and people were saying, this program sounds good. But in fact, you know, I know a story from my village where this person wanted to get the benefits, but they didn't. Or this other story when people said this new system takes them longer. And so they were able to produce this evidence of saying, look, you know, we surveyed thousands of people and it takes less time. It reduced leakage. More beneficiaries get what they wanted and what they deserved. And also there's overwhelming support for this program, right? So there's like over 90% support for this. And this was able to beat these, some of these anecdotes or maybe vested interests if you're, if you're more cynical to say, to say, look, this is, this is something we should, we should pursue. So examples like this are examples where we can say with a little more confident confidence, 
there was there was impact, but again, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's impossible sh- to know the counterfactual in any specific case. Yeah, and yeah. nobody's more you know strict about that than, <laughs> than you know development economists. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you end up uh, working at at Sega? So somebody somebody who studies uh, employment and social networks told me that in any context that you look, about fifty percent of jobs are through social networks. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not through these all these assignment mechanisms. And so I found it through social networks. When I decided I wanted to work on global poverty, I did a lot of research on my own to see you know what are people saying, what's the most effective thing, and I found that a lot of the people that were saying very smart things about world poverty were. These people at, uh, at J-PAL and Sega, a lot of these development economists. What uh, kind of people are you thinking of? Chris Blattman? Also, Astaire Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, Poor Economics was a book that was very influential for me. I felt it was, it's, I, I highly recommend it. It's very well written. It's a great exposition, like introduction to development research. And I felt like, you know, these people are saying, they're, they seem like the most thoughtful about it, right? They don't seem to have like an ideology driving what they're saying or, you know, there's like, you know, free markets are always best or, you know, it's only more aid that's going to help us. It's just, we just need more money. They said, well, you know, let's take an approach that measures these things yeah. and then we'll see. And I felt like they had a lot of uh, very good insights and also seemed integrated. And so I applied to a few of these, uh, of these organizations, but what eventually came through is I spoke to a person who's a professor of economics, who's Israeli, that I that I was introduced to through someone. And he introduced me to uh, another professor who's a J-PAL affiliate. And she introduced me to a professor called uh, Joshua Blumenstock, who was at University of Washington, UW at the time, and now is in Berkeley. And I spoke to him. And because I had more of this sort of data science background, which is more similar to the job, the work that he does, uh, he said, well, there's this uh, position opening up at SEGA if you want to apply for that. Uh, And I applied for it and I got it. What other similar places could you go to if you wanted to, to leave Seeger? What's, what's, what's the range of places doing you know, data science and development work? Yeah, so I, I'm, always, I'm always afraid that I'm not looking at all the other places because it's always more easy, you know, it's much easier to be exposed to, to your recent, you know, vicinity of like, like-minded people and organizations and so on. My impression has been uh, that there isn't a whole lot at this time. And that's due... First, to lack of data, because it's not, not everything happens, you know, on digital devices in the developing world. Many things happen in person. And so it's not like you have data about every, every transaction that you can imagine. You know, the cases that I mentioned where you might have digital electronic data about, you know, a lot of, a lot of transactions that are important is pretty rare. Not everybody collects, almost nobody collects these in developing countries. Yeah. It's slowly changing, but it'll be a while. And so one thing, thing is lack of data. And the second thing is that if you've traveled to a developing country, you know that a lot of day-to-day life is not mediated by information technology, right? You know, people go and work in their fields in rural areas, and, and that's what they do. And they get paid in cash, and then they might call their friends with their phones, but a lot of what they do is not that. So if you want to influence them somehow through technology, you don't have a lot of like endpoints, right? It's not that, it's not like uh, in the developed world where many people, a lot of what they do is in front of a computer and they surf the web all the time and you can find them and, you know, influence the way that they, they do things. So these two things combine to, to the fact that there isn't, there aren't too many organizations where I feel like, you know, they need a data scientist now, certainly not, you know, the most uh, effective organizations. That said, I think there's, there's good work being done both in academia and in these specific cases where you have a lot of data and you have somebody that's more reformatted. And I think in these cases, there might be a large impact just because this approach hasn't fully penetrated there as it has to industry. But if you have the mindset, like, like we have many people in the tech world have, is, you know, you know, data is going to solve everything, then I, I would say that's not the case. In the you might be world. a bit disappointed in, in India. Yeah, just a little bit. So the other large one, I guess, is J-PAL. Uh, at MIT, right? That might be the most similar organization to SEGA. Yes, J-PAL and, and IP are sister organizations of SEGA. We, we work closely together. Okay. What are the main differences, if, if there are any? Sure. So one difference between SEGA and, uh, and J-PAL. So again, this is talking about the branch of SEGA that's about development research and not about you know, transparency in the social sciences or the global networks, which are just different activities. But for development research, there are a few differences. One is that SEGA affiliates are not strictly economists. JPL affiliates, as far as I know, they're all in economics. And so SEGA has a few people like Josh that I mentioned that is a computer scientist and, and some engineers, political scientists. And so that is, that is a bit broader. The second is obviously what I mentioned, the geographical focus. It's on the West Coast of the U.S., so no, no other universities. And then there is, so JPL also has country offices. 
uh, and IPA as well, and Innovations for Poverty Action. So they also have country offices where they actually implement randomized controlled trials. SEGA doesn't have country offices. And so when our affiliates, some of whom are also, are also JPO affiliates, want to implement their field research, if they are doing field research, then they would go through JPAL or through IPA or through other, another implementing organization. Uh, and so SEGA staff deals only with sort of the, the U.S.-based activities of, you know, grant, grant making and communications and those things and not the actual implementation of the programs. What are the benefits of working in a kind of top academic environment like you would have at, at UC Berkeley? Is that something that people should really be focused on getting access to? I actually think it is. I think I'll explain what I think is great about it. So there's two things that I feel, especially many effective altruists or people that are more like inclined to solve these analytical problems, uh, and that's their, their strong point, could benefit from that. One is that working in a top institution, you really are working with people that are very smart, very capable, very good at what they do. Uh, which if you've worked in various companies of people with various talents, you know it's very important. There's a lot that you achieve with a group of very smart people that you can rely on, you know, to, to do their best and you can, you know, communicate your ideas, you gain from their ideas and, you know, decisions are being made well. So very talented people is important. The second thing I think is the sort of combination of brand name and existing connections. So, you know, if I think of myself two years ago, I think I had similar talents, less knowledge about, you know, about development, but not something that I think would, you know, would, would be an obstacle if I wanted to work in, in a new organization. But I had nowhere near the same, the same connections uh, that I do now from knowing people. And many of these people, again, these top, all these projects that I mentioned, I did not approach the government of a state in India. These were existing connections that people have cultivated over a long period of time. And I think people are, they're better at this than I am. And so I'm very happy to have people who have that strong point do that and have, and have, you know, my work be what I'm good at. So I think these connections are very, very valuable and using people's existing connections is a, is a very strong, strong reason. So you got your current job through networking and I guess now with an even bigger network, you'll be in an even better position to, to get whatever kind of job you want uh, next. Uh, no, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. If I want to be, you know, the, if I want to be the prime minister of Ethiopia, not sure how much my, work, my network can help, but yeah, but yeah, definitely more opportunities now. Uh, are, are you thinking that academia then might be different from working in a nonprofit, uh, just delivering an intervention that perhaps the, like the network or the, or the intellectual standards might not be as high as, as, as if you're at a great university? I am concerned about that. And again, I don't, I don't know the nonprofit sector very well. My impression is that some organizations are more dedicated to impact evaluation, to monitoring, to these things, uh, and some are less. And as a result, some are, I think, you know, provably uh, very effective and, and some are not. So I, I think I would definitely be concerned about working in an organization that, that you know, goes on gut or goes mm -hmm. on things that are sort of not, you know, quantitative, results-based, inference, you know, all these things that you want to empirical. really be sure that, yeah, empirical, to be sure that you're, that you're having the impact that you would want. I think some are. So people have uh, diverging views about, about who's, you know, as as a recipient of, of a project or a beneficiary or a government uh, in a developing country who's better to work with. I think there are advantages each way. I think some people say, you know, they trust us because we're academics. We don't have, you know, we're not, for example, I don't know, USCID that might have some other ulterior motive or something like that. Uh, they know we're in it for, you know, for the, for the knowledge or for the benefit. Some people say that, you know, academics are, are a little too, they're not stable enough, right? You know, you complete the project and then the academics don't stay for many years after that. And so, so I think there's, you know, ups and downs to both. I guess if you went to a nonprofit, you might find people who excel in a different domain like operations or implementation and things like that. But it would, but it would take you away from the academic track potentially. That's also true. I mean, if you want to, if you're pursuing an academic track, then you, you probably want to be around academia and that's how the system works. You know, you need yeah. the recommendation letters, you need the, the network and that sort of stuff. So uh, you and SIGA are also interested in reforming problems in, in academia to try to make kind of published papers and their, and their results uh, more reliable sources of uh, you know, information that people can really trust. Uh, to tell, us, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, so that's not my, my main focus area, but I'll tell you what I know. I think this is extremely important. So if you're familiar with uh, the way scientific research works uh, internally, then you know that there are a lot of these, of these practices in social sciences, but also in other sciences that are a little problematic. For example, you only publish results it, or results tend to be published 
if they are statistically significant, meaning that they couldn't have happened by chance. But this statistical significance can sometimes be engineered. One way that I mentioned is just like testing, having, you know, secretly having 20 hypotheses and then just testing 20 of them. So one of them will be, you know, with a significance level of uh, 0.05, which means it'll happen by chance once every 20 hypotheses. Obviously, it would happen because you tested 20 hypotheses or, you know, on average one. And so if you only publish that one and don't let anybody know about the other 19, then you create a result that's published, but obviously it's just false. So this uh, about, I think, 10 years ago, uh, there started being a discussion in scientific circles about, about this being a very, very present problem. So this is not some edge case. This is, this is a problem that happens, that happens a lot in mainstream science, in top institutions. A lot of the practices were this way, and sometimes people were not even aware that these are you know, harmful practices. It's just what you did, what you learned. And so there started being a, a, a movement around this uh, and, and a lot of hype. And this was called the reproducibility crisis because people would just, it was called the reproducibility crisis because, because people would, you know, try to reproduce the same research. And obviously, if they test my hypothesis that I just engineered somehow and they're going to try and recreate the experiment, they're not going to get the same result. It won't replicate, right? And so it's not reproducible reproducible research. I prefer to call it the uh, published results being false crisis. Um, <laughs> Makes it very clear what the problem is. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's not that, you know, it's about something intangible as reproducibility. It's about, you know, science not producing the truth, which is a big problem. And so if you think about it, the problem might be clear, but the solutions are not that easy, right? I mean, how would you know that people didn't test a lot of a lot of different hypotheses? How would you know that people didn't, you know, do whatever, play with their data a little bit in a way that would produce these results? Uh, and so there's emerging research about better practices to to do this. One example that I that I mentioned before is is releasing your your data from your from your experiment and also and also the analysis so that anybody can check that your analysis is, is correct, at least, you know, at the, at the code level. And they could also say, well, you know, now that we look at the nitty gritty of the analysis, we see that actually they dropped, you know, 30% of their observations and never reported them because, you know, people didn't answer a specific question. And this causes like sample selection, or this is a problem that would, that would you know, bias the result that they can publish that the criticism. And, and you can obviously realize why the individual scientists might not always have the incentive to, to make these available. So we need to create the incentive environment to do this. Right. Another thing is um, is pre-registration. That's another good practice. That's where you you commit to the analysis that you're going to do beforehand, before you collect the data, before you do anything. So and you then, can't then gerrymander the analysis to get just whatever result you want. Exactly. Or if you do, people will know because you know you didn't even list it, or you listed it, you know, number fifty in your list of analysis that you're going to do. And so people will say, wait, what, what about the first 49? What happened? Yeah. Uh, and so, don't, don't, don't look at those. <laughs> don't, just, don't worry about those. <laughs> Oops. Um, so that's another practice that would lead to, you know, to results being more, more trustworthy. There are a lot of other standards around, you know, how you should, how you should keep your data and how you should uh, yeah. you keep your code and how you should you do significance. Maybe journals should do results blind review, which is, you know, for example, suppose there really isn't an effect. Right. Suppose I test if, you know, there was a, a big, a very strong example of uh, whether canvassing changes people's minds. So there was research uh, that ended up being uh, completely fraudulent. Somebody made up the data, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I, hope not well, I, guess. I think that the, the original research was uh, completely made up or the, the surveys weren't done. But then someone reproduced it anyway, or they found that, in fact, it was a true result. If, if they'd done the research, they probably would have gotten a positive result anyway. It's, uh, it is an effect that exists. It's just oh, that the, I, the first paper didn't, didn't do the experiment. <laughs> oh, interesting. So I, so I thought it ended up being, being not, you know, the results not reproducing. But OK, anyway, I'll, we'll anyway. go back and double check that yeah. and I'll link to that. Uh, but, but anyway, the, the point was that uh, just because something is like a flashy, you know, new, exciting idea, doesn't necessarily mean it should be published over, you know, rejecting a, a well-established uh, hypothesis. So if somebody were to do uh, an experiment about something that's that's very well known in psychology or that many people think is important, you wouldn't want the result to be published or not published based on what they find, right? The state of the world, yeah. right? You want it to. So so the idea is to say let's do a results blind review where somebody submits their research proposal, they submit everything, and then they say what the interpretation be both ways, mm -hmm. and people review that article, that that paper, and decide if to publish it or not this way without knowing whether it has an extraordinarily strong result or a null result. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then you and you then publish it and people know the truth. And that's yeah. a way to sort of protect ourselves from some of these effects. Yeah, so this issue of the, the, the science producing false results uh, crisis has, has come up on the podcast before because it just it, it appears again and again. If, if you just can't trust what published papers say, then, then we're really in a deep hole. 
But it seems like the, the, the trickiest part is making it, giving academics incentives to reform the system because the, the ones who currently control it are thriving in the current environment where uh, the incentives aren't aligned with always uh, you know, producing accurate, accurate results. It's better just to produce lots of papers that are kind of unreliable but produce like interesting figures. Are we making progress on actually reforming the system, given that there must be like many people who would probably would not be in their interest to, to see the system change that much? Yeah, so I think there is progress mm. that we're definitely making. So yeah. more and more journals have an open data and open code policy. So they require this of people submitting submitting their papers. So we are improving in that respect. Uh, and so I think the the environment is the incentives are slowly changing as people realize how much of of a problem this is and, and, and adapting. And, and part of the work that BITS does at SIGA is, is promoting these with journals, which I think is extremely important. Do you know uh, what's driving that change? Is it you know, personal shame or is it a, you know, a sense of that, that people actually, they, they really do want to find true results. And so now that they realize that their processes aren't so good, they uh, want to fix it up. Or is it coming from the top perhaps that people don't want to fund research if the methodology is dodgy, you know, even if the researchers might prefer to do it that way? Interesting. So, um, I'm actually not sure. Yeah. If I if I had to guess, I would say that we we sort of deceive ourselves about how many of our actions are driven by first principles and deduction, mm-hmm. right? A lot of our actions are just driven by sort of what people around us do, uh, and so I think many people did not think it's a you know they didn't really internalize the fact that it's a bad thing you know to try twenty different hypotheses until you get one right. That's what you that's what, how you did science. That's yeah. what they learned, uh, and so I think now that the view is changing among scientists. It's increasingly becoming less sort of less admissible, and then yeah. everything everything so follows just, from that. So just gradually, you have a, a, a virtuous circle, I guess. So perhaps like some researchers, they're really passionate about this topic of uh, accuracy in science, and so they adopt it because they really care about it. And then other people around them notice that they're doing it, and they're like, "Well, I guess in principle this is a better way to do it." And so they just they pick it up as well, and it kind of spreads. Like a like a virus, or a, I suppose I don't know a Justin Bieber music video. <laughs> exactly like Justin Bieber. I think also there's uh, with with some of these uh, changes in mechanism, like you know, like open data and those things. People can you know do your analysis again and show you know that what you've done is not is not right. And so you, there is this a bit of a bit of a fear of being of a, you know re, your results not replicating. There's the carrot right? and the stick. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's also that also might be might be driving that. It's a it's a good thing for science. So speaking of reproducibility uh, problems, uh, some people have criticized randomized controlled trials as being very expensive to conduct each time and also having low generalizability. So you maybe you find that one intervention worked at this particular village in India, but then do you really know that it's going to work in a different context, in a different country, with a different culture, with you know different people uh, in- implementing it and perhaps doing it somewhat differently? So if you have something that's quite expensive and perhaps just doesn't generalize that much to, to other cases, are RCTs actually that useful, and are, and are they are they good uh, value for money? So I think it's a it's a it's a very general question, right? I mean, there's a, a whole spectrum of RCTs, and obviously the best ones are worth the money, and maybe the worst ones aren't worth the money. Uh, I think with respect to to generalizability, uh, I can say two things. And again, I'm not the foremost uh, expert on this, but one is that there has been a, a meta analysis uh, by uh, Eva Vivalt, which found that RCTs broadly do replicate. It's not a correlation of one, but it's a correlation of, uh, I forget, I think more than 0.5 or something like that. So there is some kind of, you know, there is a correlation. It's not like we do these RCTs and then each one produces a, a different result and we'd have to do like, you know, 10 or 20 of them in order to be certain of, of something. That said, obviously different contexts have have different states. And so the second response that I heard from Rachel Glenister, who's the director of J-PAL, is that what you should generalize is the principles being learned and not, you know, the effect sizes or the results exactly, right? And so if you understand that teaching at the right level to the class is very beneficial because in many developing countries, teachers teach way above the class level, the grade level. And so children broadly don't understand much and then don't don't improve over the years. Then this is a lesson that's more general and can be applied in different contexts. Your specific intervention of, you know, separating the class into, you know, various, various things could differ with, you know, the implementing partner or with, you know, the context. Maybe in some countries it would work, some countries it wouldn't, and so on. But the, the general principles might hold, and those are the things you should generalize. And if you have your theory of change, then you can 
you know, single out these things in theory of change that might or might not work in, in a different context and sort of, you know, check the boxes and say, see that they, they do, they do work and then, and then implement. I do think, I mean, you could say RCTs are not, of course, they're not perfect, but in some cases, they're the best thing we have to really have inference because some, some attribution problems are very, very difficult. You know, if you wanted to test the, the, the quality of private schools versus public schools, it's very, very hard to know because the kids who attend those schools are very different. Uh, and so if you have a policy, you might want to want to do that. And the, the last thing I can say is that comparing RCT, I'm not sure what the alternative is, right? Because you, you think maybe research is just empirical research is completely not of value, right? We should just like go go on like, you know, anecdotes and smart people's opinions. But if you think research is valuable, then a lot of the, these criticisms levied against RCTs go for all empirical research. And you don't you don't have a lot of I mean, if you're doing your data collection, that sort of stuff, which is expensive, it's going to be expensive in a lot of a lot of kinds of empirical research, and the generalizability might be the same issues in empirical research. So I think a different comparison is is to compare how much you spend on a program versus how much you spend on research and evaluation. And if you look at the sums that are spent on social programs around the world, the sums spent on rigorous evaluation are tiny. So if I'm a country, right, and I'm going to implement this reform in education. I would want, because this reform is going to cost billions of dollars, I would want to spend, you know, a, few, a million dollar, a million dollars or maybe, you know, maybe less on a rigorous RCT to show me that it's, that it's really working. I'll see if I can get uh, Eva on, on the show sometime to, to talk about uh, her paper. And, I, and I'll stick up a link to it because I think, it, yeah, it, it deals pretty, pretty well with this question. But speaking of what, what other approach could you take other than empiricism? I suppose that there is kind of theorizing. I mean, economists have, tr- have tried to do this. They try to like model the economy and they think... Well, at least some of them think that they have like reasonable understanding of the principles by which people operate or firms operate. And from that, they can deduce or they, they can produce predictions about, you know, how different policies will, will affect the outcome. I guess that has to go uh, hand in hand with empiricism to some extent. But, you know, maybe, maybe the balance. I, I saw recently that about 90 percent of papers in uh, development economics are empirical papers. And maybe that maybe that's gone a little bit too far. Maybe it should be more like 20 percent uh, should be should be theory focused. Uh, what, what do you think of that? So I do know that it's a, that it's, this is a good point to again, remind, you know, the listeners that I'm not an economist. (laughs) So my formal training in economy, in economics is not, not very wide. Uh, So quoting smarter people that are more knowledgeable. I think a lot of economists criticize development economics for not being enough theory driven. And I would uh, say that's what I like about it. Uh, Because I honestly think a lot of these models you know, they just leave out important things. And we don't know that these things are important. And in some situations they are, some situations they aren't, right? And so some problems can be solved without a model at all. Or they can solve, you know, with a, you know, consultancy approach, which is like, we'll be smart, we'll be analytical about this, we'll figure it out. And some, and some can't. And so I'm skeptical of, of a lot of these models. And I think if you look at these predictions for, for a lot of these models, these are not predictions, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, there are these two uh, opposing forces. One says people are risk averse. On the other hand, people want to want to invest, you know, to improve their, their utility. So what will they actually do? Well, we don't know. You know, it depends on how strong these are in a specific context. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think what, what drew me to, again, the sort of like the, the development economists that are in the, the mainstream today is that a lot of them didn't seem very, you know, ideological about the theory and we were very like empirical. You know, we go, we talk to people in the villages, we, we see the problems, we research and we understand the context very well, but we also are, are rigorous about the methods and we're not, we don't let, you know, general theory guide us because it often, it often misguides us. There was recently a debate between uh, Lant Pritchett, who is an economist at the Center for Global Development, and uh, Chris Blattman, who's a development uh, statistician. I'm not sure what his affiliation is, but uh, Lant, Lant Pritchett was arguing that he thinks kind of the biggest gains in development uh, are really to be had at, at the macro level with, with big policy reforms. And he points to the, the case of Deng Xiaoping, uh, you know, reforming uh, communist China to, to be somewhat more market oriented and, and allowing foreign investment and allowing uh, big manufacturing uh, in, industries uh, to grow and pe- people to earn profits and, and, and so on. And he thinks that, that the gains there were, were, were so large that they, uh, they really kind of swamp the, the gains that you might get from uh, testing uh, individual interventions and, and, then, and then scaling them up given the kinds of uh, money that's, that's available. Uh, so, so to him, he thinks maybe doing uh, more ICTs and just trying to you know, move a, a bit more or less money towards different social interventions might be uh, a bit of a distraction. But, but Chris Blattman, who does this kind of uh, research, uh, pushed back on that. Do, do, do you ever have a view on, on this debate? 
I think so. I I listened to it or read it. Mm-hmm. I think you do, and I I thought Chris Bratman's response was very thoughtful, and he said, "Yes, growth is is very 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 important." And you know, I agree. If I could push a lever and, and accelerate uh, given developing countries' growth by one percent, I would you know give a lot of money to get in the room that has that lever. But we're not we're not really sure, unfortunately, on on how to do that. So. It's hard to what Chris says is that it's hard to link, you know, the day job of a, of a growth economist to these changes. You know, maybe we could have some reforms that are useful. I do think from an effective altruism perspective, finding reforms that you think are very useful or there's the good evidence to say are, are useful and then strongly advocating for them in poor countries could be an extremely effective thing to do. So I definitely agree with that part. The part about figuring out figuring out growth it could be that growth is made up of all these like different you know good policies that we do separately and it's not like growth is not a you know a single atom but it's composed of many of these good policies so you know figure out good policies you think institutions are other problem there are a lot of like good development economists that research institutions in developing countries and try to figure out you know what are the efficiency costs of corruption of red tape of these different sorts of things so I, I definitely think that's important as well I'll, uh, I'll stick up uh, links to both uh, Lant and uh, Chris's uh, um, blog, you know, various uh, interviews and uh, blog posts about this so, uh, so people can have a listen. It's, uh, it's, it's very provocative uh, regardless of um, uh, what, where you end up coming down. So changing tack, uh, what is it that drew you to apply effective altruist ideas to try to do as much good as possible with your career? Uh, so often people ask me these questions. I say uh, moral absolutes, and I assume most people like would, would laugh. But <laughs> uh, so I can actually explain what what appealed to me. And so I think for a long time I thought that uh, various I think two you know main moral principles that I think are are true of our morality of our of our ethical system is that one. There is a sort of symmetry between people. You can't want something for yourself and for other people, you know, want it to be differently. Uh, another way of looking at it is the veil of ignorance or, you know. Golden rule. Perhaps as well. Yeah. Treat others as you'd want to be treated. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and so and so if you apply that, you know, that symmetry to, to other people in the world, clearly, you know, you know, if a, if a poor African can decide what I should do with my finances they wouldn't decide, yes, I should keep all of them. You know, I should just like do whatever it is that I do and, you know, live with my happy family and everything. They'd want me to, to do something about it. Mm-hmm. So that's one. And then the other thing was that I felt like there was no moral distinction between action and inaction. Mm-hmm. So you're responsible for, for your actions uh, and deciding, you know, not to think about a problem or not to engage with that problem is a decision. It's an action you take. And, and you're responsible for the consequences of, of that action. So, you know, if I decide to spend all my money on, on cars, I'm responsible for the action of not spending that money on something that benefits other people. So, and if I spend my career on, you know, uh, working for uh, uh, whatever training company that I think doesn't really improve the world and only keeping the, the money for me, then, then I'm responsible for that for that decision. So you don't even think that the action in action distinction really makes sense in principle. It's just a spurious idea. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think I think if you when I thought about it long and hard, I figured out that there are many cases where you can't really even state what's the action, what's the inaction, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if I had to press a button to keep all my money from going to charity and I press that button, is that action or inaction, right? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I think it's, you, a, I think it's you, a good point. And, and I think also this, you can also apply, you know, the symmetry or the golden rule to that. Like, would I want other people to use the action in action distinction as a, as a justification to, to do something that would harm me? I probably wouldn't accept it, mm. right? Just if they just said, well, you know, but this is what we were doing. It sounds like you're pretty sympathetic to utilitarianism. Would that be fair to say? Uh, somewhat, yeah. Um, I think you know there there are some 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 issues, ri- some issues obviously, yeah. but I think I like the sort of you know smaller set of assumptions that yeah. I indicated because I think they would be agreed upon by many people. Whereas the sort of utility thing where you start like doing you know math and summing things. Mo- a lot of people would be averse to that, but they might agree to these these sort of principles. But I do think there's a lot of merit to to that. Yes, yeah, interesting. So, uh, you know, if you don't buy the action in action distinction, and you think that you should treat people impartially, kind of says you should do as much good as possible. Why why choose to work on on poverty specifically rather than perhaps some other problem in the world? Sure. So. First of all, uh, I would say that I think if somebody else is working on a different problem that they think can have can do more good to to many people, that's that's great. And I would I would never be critical of that. And I do think part of the reasons that I work in poverty is that 
you should also consider what you are inclined to do and want to do. So I like being in developing countries. I, I traveled extensively in developing countries and I loved it. Uh, I enjoy, you know, working on that. I, it's very, it's rewarding to me in a sense. And so I think I chose uh, global poverty in a sense before I chose effective altruism, which, you know, is not the, you know, most perfect principle, but you also have to be honest with yourself yeah. and, and know yourself. And so that's, that's what I did. I do feel, you know, one distinction I feel very strongly about is that our moral circle doesn't just encompass people that are close to us or are in our own country. And so if you think I have the same amount of obligation to somebody in my country as I do to somebody in another country, then pretty quickly you, you, you realize that you should work for people in other countries just because poverty is so much more dramatic and so much more, more suffering is involved. You know, like people say, well, you know, there are poor people. I come from Israel. So people say, you know, there are poor people in Israel as well. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly true. And working for those people is very important. But those, the children of those people don't die from malaria. And so I do think the problems are greater and there is more you can do. There's, you know, an amazing opportunity to, to improve the world in poor countries. And so, and so I strongly feel like if you, if you think every life has equal value, you should be working where there is the most suffering and the most opportunity. So data science and machine learning are like two of the paths that we, that we really uh, recommend to people. Um, in your experience, is it a good career? Are you glad that that's where you specialized? I love it. I think it's a great career. <laughs> Everybody should be a data scientist. No, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think it's, it's great for me. I think if you're inclined to that kind of work, you know, you might enjoy, you know, testing things out for yourself with a little code. You know, you don't have to enjoy building systems, but you enjoy like getting results quickly. You enjoy looking into problems, getting to know them uh, deeply, like sort of analytical, mathematical, statistical problems, modeling them. That's something I, I very much enjoy. I think if you enjoy those things, then data science has the added appeal of being very much sought after these days. And so, you know, I could be, I could be really enjoying my art. Unfortunately, our world doesn't reward you, you know, fiscally yeah. for that. And so, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't suggest to somebody who's, you know, you can do it as a hobby, you can do it in many ways. I don't know if I'd suggest that as a, as a career simply because that's the world we live in. And so data science is very, very rewarding in that aspect of, of, you know, being sought after. And so, you know, you get people take things off your plate and let you do your, your thing if you're good at it. And so... I've had a lot of a lot of fun working with data science. Let's say that someone's listening and they're they're an undergraduate and they're thinking, you know, maybe I want to study data science, but you know, I'm not sure that it's a great fit for me. Are, are there any like you know objective indicators that they can use to tell whether it's the kind of thing that they would excel at and enjoy? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the the best test for something is to kind of try it on for size uh, and do something that's close and and see if you enjoy it. So, for example. Uh, if you try to, to take up some kind of programming in a friendly language like Python and you just absolutely detest it, you know, you can't do it, you only want to work uh, with, a, with a pen and paper, then, then maybe it's not for you. If you don't like, you know, working in front of a computer every day, all, all day, then maybe, maybe it's not for you. Uh, if you're really averse to, to numbers and statistics, obviously, obviously it's not for you and that's important, right? I mean, you can't just sort of go around that you'll need to you know work with data a lot i think if you're somebody who likes who's like extremely you know likes the 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 cleanness of like very academic research and you know just strict modeling and that sort of stuff where you know reality and all its in all its you know uh idiosyncrasies doesn't you know come in to destroy your your beautiful beautiful model then maybe this is not for you because many times there are these you know you have to deal with with real things. But again, there's also a broad array of, of data science jobs for when the more theoretically leaning, you know, do research in machine learning, find a better model on a, on a training set or uh, to something very, very practical, you know, like produce indicators, you know, having like being the, the right hand of somebody who needs to, to decide policy. So I would say the elements are, are statistics and uh, statistics and kind of math and, and research, which is a bit more difficult to, to know if you, if you like or not, and programming. What's the most annoying part of your job? I think, I think I, I'm having difficulties with, uh, with a few things. And one of them is that the, your success doesn't depend only on your skills. And it's not because people want to wanna, you know, harm you in any way. It's just that you're working with a partner and you know, they're a government or they're someone and they have their, their own reasons and incentives. Sometimes they understand or don't understand what you're doing. And you could have this brilliant idea. You solve the analytical problem and that won't matter because nothing would happen. Right. And and things being out of out of your control is 
is sometimes frustrating. Mm. I think I've also had to adapt to the fact that in the world of academia, and I think in a lot of the nonprofit sector, there's a lot of reporting of what you do. Uh, so I was talking to somebody who did the opposite transition from academia to data science in a private company. And she said, you know, it's amazing. I, I finish what I do. If I want, I do a write-up. If not, I just, you know, I commit. And it's part of the it's part of the system now. And then I'm done with it. There's no, like, two years of, you know, going around, presenting things, changing, you know, people's minds. And there there's definitely a lot of, like, communicating with other people and communicating about your work, which I, I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't sort of prepared for him. Mm. You know, it's okay, but I don't think it's a highlight of my, of my work. Yeah. So you're using your data science skills to solve a particular kind of problem in a particular way. Are there any other particularly useful things that you would recommend that other people doing data science uh, work on? Any other, other problems where the skill set is uh, really uh, uniquely well positioned to help? Yeah. So I think, again, from, from an effective altruism perspective, you have to remember data scientists of the world that... <laughs> Our skills, as opposed to, you know, the skills of some, you know, artists or others are very much rewarded in the private market in the developed world. And so you could do a lot of good by going, getting a higher earning job and and giving a lot of money to people that are very, very effective at doing these things that are great for the world. And it's not necessarily that your your skill or my skills are the best, you know, positioned in, in direct work. And I think you should be weary of thinking, well, you know, if I get a high paying job and I have a good life and it's fun, then I'm probably doing something wrong, right? I mean, I think you don't have to sacrifice a lot to be you know, the most uh, virtuous, I would say, or to do, to do the most good. So you have to remember, first of all, there is this, this option. And if you enjoy what you're doing and you're earning a lot of money, seriously consider giving a lot of that money if it's still rewarding to you in a, in a fun lifestyle for you. That said, I think on global poverty, you should look for places where, where there is scalability, right? So large organizations, you're not going to, you know, doing data science on one village that has one specific program, you know, you can optimize that program by 10%, but it's not going to pay your salary. Uh, or, you know, it might pay your salary in a system of perverse, you know, incentives of donors and everything, but it's not a good thing for the world. So you should look for large systems where where data exists and where the relationship exists and people are, are willing to change. So, so I think a lot of the promise is working with governments because they have these large data sets, sometimes at least they have the ability to create these data sets. They have the ability to change things that are very important. I mean, we discussed growth and institutions, so they have the ability to change those things. I think if you have an opportunity to get, so, so to speak, very close to the fire where these very important and large decisions are being made and contribute with your, with your expertise, then, then that's a good thing. I think the last thing I would say is that you should always ask yourself, am I doing something that a local person could not have done? Right. Is, is it really needed to have, you know, this very high end expertise here to improve things? Because because wages in developing countries are very low. And so if you can get 100 people to do something manually, maybe you're better off not having a data science project. Speaking of other things that you can do, what kind of stuff did you do in the Israeli army? Is, is that something you can talk about or is it is it all classified? Uh, I can tell you, but then I'll have to kill you. <laughs> um, that sounds like it's worth it. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I can I can discuss uh, the the specifics of the of the work, but I can say that I did um, I did uh, mathematical research and a lot of a lot of data research and uh, and algorithms uh, to solve these these research problems that would be from you know last from weeks to month and would be would months it would be very difficult uh, and sometimes impossible. We had a a slogan that says like what's uh, What's very hard we already we're already doing. So what's impossible that's going to take a lot of time, right? <laughs> so it's it was it was very much this sort of uh, atmosphere of, of solving very very difficult research problems with team with a team of other other researchers. So you might not think about it when you think about an army, but um, but the Israeli army, because of uh, mandatory service, can choose from basically the entire cohort of kids that turn you know eighteen that year and and become you know eligible to to be drafted. And so. What you would rightly imagine is that an army doesn't have a huge demand for mathematicians. Uh, and so you can get a lot of the very best mathematicians uh, in the country, if you, if you find them, to, to come join this unit. And so there are a lot of extraordinary people, you know, extremely smart people, extremely capable uh, doing these things. And I think I learned, I both got, you know, training that's worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, you know, in, in, in salary, because before I studied physics and mathematics before, before going to the army. And... I spent six years there and that training was, was invaluable because if you just study something like physics and mathematics, it's not immediately practical. You can go into academia or you're going to have to do 
additional training in order to be a data scientist. But working there on like learning statistics and learning how to work with data really taught me a lot of the skills that I use today, but also these more, I'd say, intangible skills of how to do research, how to approach uh, a difficult problem uh, and, so to speak, you know, bang your head against the wall until the wall breaks and and how to, you know, pursue, say, okay, you know, there's another tool that I would need. I'll develop this tool or I'll learn this skill. And and also just having sort of a sense for for data, just like knowing, oh, well, this seems like, you know, something's off here. This seems like, you know, it's going this way, learning to generate hypotheses and test them with data. So a lot of that, I, I feel like it was, it was great training, both, you know, professionally. And I also had a lot of fun. I, I did for six years. It's very good. So let's shift gears now and try to dig down as specifically as we can to get advice that people listening could actually use to, uh, you know, go into data science or, or otherwise work on global poverty in an effective way. Where should young people start if they want to work in global poverty and solving global poverty in a similar way to, to what you, you're doing? Yeah, so I think I might be unusual in that um, I didn't start out wanting to work on global poverty. I had, a, you know, I worked uh, for, I studied and then I I had my, you know, my my job in the army, which was not focused on, on global poverty at all. Uh, then I traveled, and then I decided I wanted to get into it. Uh, and then I still worked for a private company that wasn't. I mean, I don't think it was. I think it was doing good to the world, but not like the kind of good that I want to do. And so I think there's a lot to be said for starting in the private sector for data science. I think I think the work that I'm doing today might be more impactful, but. It's not building up my, my skills as well as working in a private company. And there are a few reasons for that. One is that there are not many data scientists sort of hanging out in academia. And so it's hard to learn from other people. Or you'd often be alone in a project. There's a lot of need to sort of, you know, you, know, you want to get the results. And again, this is, you know, reporting the results and maybe publishing and that sort of stuff is not necessarily conducive to developing exactly the data science skills that enable best problem solving. And in a private company, they're very results driven. They have a lot of data. They have the newest technologies, which is very important. So I think it's very important to get a lot of hands-on experience if you want to be a good data scientist, a good data scientist. And, um, and I think a good place to do that is in the private sector. And I think it's also more important to sort of get your quote unquote credentials doing that, right? I mean, if you have, if you've worked for a, pub, a private sector company and this company has a brand that you can use, then okay, you really, you have this sort of stamp of approval that really helps going into other things later. Um, I think I heard uh, Will McCaskill say something similar on, on the Econ Talk podcast yeah. and it resonated with me that you, I mean, if you want to work in non-profit sector, it's not sure that the first thing you should do, you know, out of college mm -hmm. is go work in the non-profit sector. So potentially, yeah, go and build career capital in the private sector and then, you know, cash out in terms of impact later on. Yeah. Uh, is, is, there, is there a risk of going into the private sector and uh, not building skills that are going to be relevant to like the specific research questions that you want to do in order to, to do good later on? I think to be slightly controversial, I think people in development are a little high on, you know, how much development experience is important, especially, you know, for, for my type of job. I know that if today I had to... To hire another data scientist, I'd go for the better person with, you know, better data skills instead of the person with more development experience. There is something to be said for development experience. I think I wouldn't take a person that I think, you know, would never, you know, be set foot in a developing country, would never understand these considerations, you know, would be annoyed that things are not working perfectly well and anywhere outside the private sector. But but I think it's it's overestimated how much development experience is important for this position. I think yeah. the, the data skills are 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 the more more important part and so unless you think you know you'll just get detached completely and be sucked into the private sector never to return again <laughs> uh which i don't think is i i was afraid of that but i didn't think i don't think it happened so i'd say maybe it's not like, that much fun yeah <laughs> i think it is fun yeah. but uh and you, you get used to the snack bar um <laughs> but um but I think if you really care about this i think maybe maintaining it as as an outside interest you know reading things Staying sort of up to date with the with the goings on uh, is 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 enough to to sustain you and give you sort of the development experience. That's not to say that's not how people are going to hire. So I, I can't attest to hiring practices. I can say what I think would make you a better, more excel at this position. 
I guess if you were doing implementation in the developing world or something with a lot of cultural sensitivity, so trying to you know figure out and develop an intervention to try to you know change people's cultural practices, then it might be a different story. In the case, it might be that you know direct hands-on experience in uh, in the in the area that you're working in could could be most important. I, I think it could be most important, but again, I mean, it, it comes at the expense of other things. And if you're working in a in a different place, I think it's important to have an understanding of how real people work in 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 developing countries. I think you can also get that by traveling or you know being involved with with a project. It's good that you don't just do it by by reading papers. I do think you get a lot in terms of like getting things to happen. If you're not going to do an implementer part, if you're going to do an implementer part uh, position in the future, that's extremely important. I think if you're going to do you know a desk job, you know crunching numbers, quote unquote, like working with data, I think you're, you need this sort of data, data experience. And so if you spend your time, you know, making sure that a lot of people do what they're told, which is very hard and, and very important, uh, you're not necessarily getting those skills. Would you like to highlight any other options or paths in tackling global poverty that are, that are different from the kind of data science that you do that you think are particularly promising that could have a, have a really big impact? Yeah. So I have two sort of inklings. One, which is sort of related, is that, and, and it's a bit cliche, but development economists that are very impact-minded, I think, could have a huge impact on the world. Like, all of these projects that I mentioned, I did not create these projects. The people who created these projects are, are development economists uh, or in partnership, of course, with, with governments. And so if you, if you want to take that route, you would have a lot of influence and you can use it to, to have a lot of impact. That's one. The second thing is that I think... If you're a very talented but also resilient product manager or marketing person, I think you'd be a very cool addition to the world of poverty alleviation because I think modern product development practices have not, you know, percolated all the way through. And so people aren't forming the tightest feedback loops. People aren't, you know, doing a lot of A-B testing. People aren't constantly measuring their, their outcomes. That's one thing. And then if you're really good at marketing, you know, maybe you can be an incredibly talented lobbyist to lobby for our reform and working with, with governments that can, or, you know, very large entities that can, that can implement these very large scale changes. Uh, so I think maybe that's not, you know, marketing is maybe not what you associate with working in, in developing countries, but I think those skills could be very useful. Often people can struggle to get their foot in the door uh, trying to work on a problem like global poverty where there's, there's a lot of people who would, would like to, to work to solve global poverty because it's quite a fulfilling and like well understood and a well appreciated problem. What are kind of the, the best organizations to work at early in your career? You've, you obviously said you know working in the private sector, but uh, what if you wanted to go and, and, and do uh, do direct work? Are there any places that it's relatively easier to get a to get a job when you're you know just finishing a, an undergraduate degree or perhaps a master's or PhD? I think getting out of like undergraduate or a master's. If you're if you're around academia, I think there are both like academic projects you could be working on, and there are also organizations that tend to be very leaning towards academia. Maybe they were founded by academics or maybe they're, you know, sort of they do a lot of M&E, uh, sort of monitoring and evaluation and so on. And so you can get a job in one of these organizations. I've heard uh, someone advised to sort of similar to the private sector recommendation is that you, if you go to work in the nonprofit sector, don't start by certainly don't start by setting up your own nonprofit and also maybe don't start by working on a, in a very small nonprofit that nobody has heard of because later on in your career, people are going to look at your CV and they're going to see a bunch of names that they don't know. Whereas if you worked for one of these like very large actors, again, this is sort of a stamp of approval to say, you know, this person was, you know, they know something. Whereas, you know, everybody, if you think about it, everybody can just, you know, found their own NGO and just write a cool name. And it's very hard to ascertain whether these organizations are, you know, doing good work or not and whether this person has, has acquired skills. So, so I think maybe working for one of the, one of the large organizations that have a, a brand might be, might be a good idea. Uh, going to the opposite end now, which, which organizations do you think are doing the, the very best work uh, where it would be ideal to, to aim to work at a long term, you know, as, as your career matures? Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm a bit biased in this, but I think rightfully biased, which is a contradiction in terms. I think you want to work in organizations that are impact minded and results minded. And I think that sort of goes through an organization. And there's a, a large problem with, you know, donation based 
organizations that they have to produce things that sound good to the donors. They don't have to be upfront about their failures because, you know, they have to not be because then maybe the funding, the funding would be withdrawn and all these things. So I think some organizations are very committed. I think the, the very best organizations that I can imagine, if you're uh, a very smart person uh, wanting to work in this, are... I'm very impressed with the uh, GiveWell and, and the Open Philanthropy Project. I think these are, uh, first of all, they're very meritocratic in that they don't require, you know, these very specific credentials and all and all this. They, they test you. Uh, and I think that's a very welcome approach. It's more aligned with what happens in the, in the private sector. I think it's places where you can have uh, a large amount of influence. But again, this is looking from the outside. Working long term, I think uh, working in uh, one of these top-notch valuation organizations, SIGA, JPAL, IPA, or working on, on academic projects can get you a lot of these very good connections, good knowledge, and, and that sort of stuff. There is a glass ceiling in working in academia, right? You're, you'd be outside looking in, uh, in a sense. So I think you have to be wary of that. You're not going to be, probably not going to become a principal investigator on a project if you're not a professor. And so that's something to be aware of. I mean, there's you'd have to go a slightly different different route perhaps there's it's hard to to advance to the very very top of these organizations are there any particular undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses or perhaps like data science boot camps that you would suggest people take a look at i could mention a few things uh none of these are are recommendations you should trust in the sense that i learned most of what i learned in the in the army if you can go to the israeli army <laughs> uh there's a specific unit you'd get top-notch, amazing training and uh, good people. But since this option is not open to most people, and even if it was, I'm not sure most people would be inclined. Um, I think there's a, a good machine learning, introduction to machine learning course on Coursera. Uh, it's very famous. You want to maybe look at Project Euler, uh, which is this cool site that has these algorithmic problems that you solve using your you know, programming language of choice. And it starts very easy and kind of gets harder. And, and it sort of gives you a sense of what algorithm work is and I think is a, is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a good way to sort of go up. Uh, as far as courses, I'd say take these really the, the nasty skills courses that you're not going to do later. I'm a big believer in introductions. Like if there's something that you think, you know, I will never study this on my own, take a class in it, uh, right? If you're, if you're saying like, I think machine learning is important, but I'll never bring myself to really learn, you know, the fundamentals or that sort of stuff, then go ahead and commit yourself to some kind of class that's going to be mean and get you to, you know, do a lot of things hands-on and will get you to learn these things. Uh, and I'd say go for the hands-on things rather than the, the very theoretical things if you want to do practical work. Do you think you would be doing more good if you'd gone out into the private sector or just somehow tried to make a lot of money and then donated it instead of doing kind of directly useful work as you're doing now? So my best answer to this is that I'm constantly unsure uh, and that I think currently, if you look at, you know, the results that I'm sure I've contributed to in the time that I'm working, I would, I'm, I would not make as much impact. I, I mean, I've not had as much impact as if I was earning to give. Uh, but it's sort of to be expected because earning to give is you get like immediate, uh, you know, immediate uh, contribution. Uh, I think, again, data science is very worded in the private sector. And so it's, I'm constantly reviewing this. I think as far as like expected benefit in the future, it's still shaping. I think it's the tide is starting to turn so that I have more impact with, uh, with what I'm doing now. But it's something I'm constantly reevaluating and, and, you know, checking with myself. So I think two things. One, it's not at all sure that it'll have more impact this way. Uh, you get a lot of salary by being a data scientist in the private sector. And the second thing is that you sh if you are going into this, you should be ready to have like a while before, you know, the impact starts. Uh, and, and it's not always easy. I think you probably would uh, be doing a lot more good in your current job than if you were earning to give. But uh, that's a whole other can of worms that we'll have to deal with uh, in, in another episode to explain uh, fully why I, why I think that. Uh, what's the biggest downside of the career path you've, that you've taken so far? I think the biggest downside is uh, is uh, living in the United States. Living, oh, uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, I live in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, which uh, many people think is the best place in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I think coming coming from Israel, where my family is, my friends are, uh, my home is in a deep sense, my culture uh, um, that has been that has been the the hardest part, and then some af aspects of the job and the differences from the private sector that I've highlighted. I think you know if you're moving to 
to a different country, then that's something to consider. But I mean, it could be different factors for different people. The, I think my conclusion from this uh, is to say uh, burnout is real. You should be aware of, of, what, of what you are not willing to do. And if you, if you are an EA and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm going to suffer from this, but it is the moral thing to do. I should do it. I should, you know, move to, to Kenya because that's where I can work and, have, and do the most good. I admire you. Be aware that it's, it's hard and it might be harder than you think. And if it means that you'll be doing it for, you know, two years and then burning out and just like, you know, you know ditching the cause completely, mm -hmm. then it's not good. You know, the, the gods of EA would, uh, would want you to do something that, that, you're, that you're able to sustain. Right. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is very important to so do something that you're, you'd be able to do for, for a while to, to have a, a significant contribution over a long time. So in addition to, to all of the work that you're doing, you also keep a, a blog where you go and try to spend time with people who are living completely different lives to you and then kind of write it up and take photos. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I have a, I have a travel blog. Uh, the way that I travel is, is maybe not the most, uh, the most standard one. I, when I travel, mostly in developing countries, but uh, not exclusively, I, um, I like to go and experience firsthand the lives of people that are, you know, normal, normal people that are, that are not, that are just lead a life that's very, very different than mine. And I find it both a lot of fun uh, and very, uh, very inspiring because you learn all these different things that you thought, well, you know, I thought humans are this way, but no, you know, Europeans and their descendants <laughs> are this way and many people are, are not this way. Um, and so it makes me reevaluate my, you know, my own life and the way the things that I'm doing, but I also, I also enjoy it a lot. So I, I just, you know, when I get to, to a different country or place, I find people that seem to be just like normal people doing, living their own life. And then I try to join them for a while and it works surprisingly well. They both agree and, you know, tell you about their life. And I, I learned a lot and, and I've had a wonderful experience with it. Yeah. Do you think it's actually useful for your work? I think it has been. Uh, well, I did a lot of it I did when I took a year off to travel before, after the army, but before I, I started getting into uh working in the in the private sector and then and then getting into world property. I think it has helped a lot. I think for one, it has taught me that, you know, this romanticized view of poverty is is not accurate. I mean, poor people don't want to be poor. Uh, they suffer a lot. Improvements in their lives really help them. They make them happier. Uh, that has been my, you know, anecdotal experience. It has also helped me a lot, I think, today in understanding how things work, uh, which is, it's a bit hard to convey, but you can get uh, a lot of like fanciful ideas about how people make decisions or what services are useful to people. And, you know, why don't, you know, people in rural Africa adopt Bitcoin, right? When, wouldn't that solve all the problems? No, it wouldn't because you understand their problems better now and you understand how they, you know, how they think about those problems, what they actually do every day. You know, you, it's easy to see people from through the, like the, the prism of, of, you know, you know, what I'm analyzing now, you know, I'm analyzing their borrowing and saving, right? And so I think about them from this person, but it's very useful to think, okay, what is this person, you know, what is this person con concerned about when they, you know, get up in the morning? What do they actually do? Where do they go? And just understanding the structure of towns and how that works and how people talk to their friends. So it's like, there's something irreplaceable about knowing how, how just everyday life happens in, in, in poor countries, which I feel is, is essential for, for research, especially since, since it's easy to miss. If you're implementing, you'll probably encounter it. Uh, but if you're sort of in an office, then you, you might miss it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll stick up a link to that blog and uh, people, people can take a look. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I would warn our, our listeners that it's uh, half Hebrew, half English, but I set it up so that you should be able to, to follow, even if you don't speak Hebrew, to your, you know, your great misfortune. And, you know, pictures are, are international, obviously. My guest today has been Ophir Reich. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Rob. It's been fun. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, you can pay us back by letting one of your friends know about the show. I'm planning out what guests we're going to interview over the next few months, so it would be great to get suggestions from listeners about who you would like to hear from. The ideal podcast guest is someone who isn't too senior, so they can speak their mind, and hasn't done a lot of media yet already, so the information we're getting out of them is new. But at the same time, they would hopefully have a lot of kind of detailed information from their own experience about how to do good, in particular within one of our priority problem areas. If you'd like to suggest someone to me, then you can just email me at rob at 80,000hours.org and I'll check them out. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.